you have to say. Well, thank you very much for inviting me, for giving me the opportunity to be here and to really think about uh, what I think is a very important book. I do think this is a particularly telling time right now in our culture. And for me, I think that the original Benedict option is Acts 2 verses 42 to 47. I want to just talk about four things quickly. One, that original, op uh, that original model. A little bit about the question of, is there a danger in Rod's book of conflating Western culture, Western civilization with Christianity? Uh, and then the role of uh, the black church around the issue of religious freedom. And finally, talk a little bit about my own experience with responding to the mandate for the, ori the original mandate for the Benedict, Benedict Option. Acts 2, 42 to 47 reads, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. To me, this is really the model for Christian life, that we should be doing the things that are outlined here, devotion to prayer, scripture, and fellowship. And I do believe that our churches have fallen far short of this, that there has been much cultural Christianity practiced, and that the church is very weak as a re result of not having taken this model seriously. I remember as an undergraduate at Harvard going to, going to uh, the Harvard Christian Fellowship and just being bewildered. I was a new Christian, and I thought that Christianity was supposed to turn your life upside down. It was supposed to reorder your priorities. Your whole life was supposed to be transformed. And here were these young people. It was warm milk and cookies. It was business as usual. It was, mm -hmm. it was really much of what Rod describes in his book, the concern with consumerism and a comfortable life. You know, getting a Harvard degree and going on to be extremely comfortable financially. The other thing that's here that I took very seriously was the promise of signs and wonders. As a Pentecostal, in our church, we take seriously the belief that God has the power to heal, to work miracles, even in the 21st century. It's something that is found in very few churches. Another thing that I think we fall short on. And it says the believers were together and had everything in common. Do we care for each other that way? Instead, we lead, as Rod described, these atomized lives separated from each other, not knowing our neighbors. And very often, church is a matter, you know, it's, you're sort of like looking at your watch. Oh, he went over, it's one hour and one minute. When is he going to end? Okay? <laughs> church is supposed to be over an hour. What's going on here? <laughs> so, but, but, but there isn't time for fellowship. There isn't time for connection. There isn't time for investing in each other's lives, for caring for each other radically as these people did because they met every day. And if anybody was in need, they were ready to sell what they had to take care of each other. That, I believe, is the original Benedict option. I think, though, that, so I celebrate this book. I celebrate this book because it holds up, for me, what is really the model for Christianity, what is really taught in the Bible, and which has been overlooked. But I want to point out where I, I, I'm concerned, and that is the feeling that there's a conflation of Christianity with Western culture. And it was, Christianity was born in a Middle Eastern milieu. Only two of the books of the Bible were written by people who were, uh, who were actually Europeans, or a man, one man who was actually a European. And much of the foundational early developments in Christianity actually took place in North Africa and moved from Africa into Europe. 
people like Origen, St. Ignatius, Athanasius, the early church fathers, you point to the importance of the patristic period, but so much of it was rooted in North Africa. And Christianity will survive the fall of the West. It's God's work, not the work of the West. And today, according to a 2011 report from the Pew Research Center, Christianity is truly a global religion. Quoting them, in 1910, about two-thirds of the world's Christians lived in Europe. Today, one in every four Christian lives in sub-Saharan Africa, just sub-Saharan Africa, and about one in eight is found in Asia and the Pacific. The share of the population that is Christian in sub-Saharan Africa climbed from 9% in 1910 to 63% in 2010. So they go on to say, Christianity today, today, unlike a century ago, is truly a global faith. I think it's really important that as we talk about the Benedict Option, as we talk about the crisis that is facing the United States and Western culture, that we take care not to alienate that section of the US population that is not white, a growing proportion of that uh, population, which I think does not necessarily, I'd like to give my kids this book to read, but I think that they would not be, they wouldn't warm to it because I think it's not written to a broad enough audience. I think that perhaps our one strategy to be explored is to draw on the dynamic, Holy Spirit-filled strength of the church in Africa and in South America to launch a revival in our creaky white churches here in the United States. <laughs> The other thing I want to say about religious freedom, Rod pointed just now to the role that the presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ played in the threat to Christian colleges in California. Happens to be my husband's uh, bishop. I just want to say this is really important because a lot of millennials see the claim to religious freedom simply as an excuse for discrimination. You pointed to the fact that when we should have been championing the cause of people who feel same-sex attraction and lead, led often really divided and painful lives, instead we condemned them. And young and millennials reject us as a result of that. They see the church as the source of the problem. But black people, we're the ones in this country who suffer the most grievous forms of discrimination. We are the ones who continue to be harmed by structural racism, by mass incarceration. And it was our faith that inspired our ancestors to lead, sorry, I have to try, oh, sorry, where's my sign? Time? Thank you. Who lead, thank you very much. Uh, that really inspired us to lead the civil rights movement, and it is so essential, if we stand up and talk about, about religious freedom, we have a level of credibility that is unparalleled in the rest of the church. Because too often the white church is associated in the minds of millennials and others with racism rather than with championing the cause of the poor. So not much time for my personal experience. I would just say that Eberhard Arnold's writings were really powerful in influencing uh, my husband, Eugene Rivers, when we were undergraduates at Harvard, really turning him on to this original Benedict option, uh, especially his book, The Early Christians and Why We Live in Community. And he was, he was struck by the authentically radical character of the Bruderhof understanding of Christian faith and practice and their sincerity in actually carrying it out. As a result, several of us as undergrads from Harvard, we were members of something called the William J. Seymour Society, traveled down to Dare Spring in Connecticut and actually saw the community in action. And we were struck by it. We went back, we weren't ready uh, to retreat. So we went back and tried to build this idea of community right in the inner city in Boston. And, but drawing strength from what we had seen there, the model of really having shared work that would bind us together, the model of a rich spiritual life with uh, sharing one another's burdens, both spiritually, emotionally, and uh, uh, economically. The model of spending time together, of really being that Christian village that Rod writes about. The model of simple living, of not embracing a consumerist culture. I'm really grateful to the role that the Ruderhof played in shaping our spiritual lives. 
as we really face the, the uh, challenges of trying to do something like this among the poor, where they, if people hadn't yet made it, it's, hard to, it's even harder to resist a consumerist culture if you've never had it, right? It's out there, everybody else has it, you've never had a, a, a bite at the apple. So those were some of the challenges we faced. And the whole question too of how you really educate the next generation, which Rod raises in his book, I think that that's a very challenging piece of what we faced. So I'm grateful for the book, grateful for the chance to talk about it, and really to encourage people to embrace this original Benedict option. <laughs>